Welcome to another Motoring Top 10. This week we're looking forward to summer with the Top 10 Budget Sports Cars. To make this realistic, we've set an upper price range of £25,000. Not exactly in the bargain bucket range, but you won't find many mainstream roadsters below 16 grand. So what constitutes a sports car? Well, we're looking at the two requirements of a traditional sports car, a soft top hood and two seats. True enthusiasts would prefer rear wheel drive, but that's not so common these days. They also want the ultimate performance for the pound, cars such as the Caterham 7 or the Lotus Elise. Choosing our top 10 was quite easy, because there aren't that many roadsters around these days. But be grateful, for back in the 1980s they were all but extinct. Into battle we go with our number 10, a pretty little number from Fiat. Beneath the flowing lines of the Barchetta lie the oily bits from the previous generation Punto. Do not dismiss this front wheel drive machine so easily though, because it's a delight to drive with its perky 1.8 litre engine and crisp handling. The hood is easy to erect, making this a painless car to own in our climate. And now for the downsides. It's only imported in small numbers in left hand drive. Because of this, part supplies can be a little slower than average. Hence, the pretty little Barchetta languishes so low in our top 10. But in build quality and driving enjoyment, it's every bit as good as the MX-5 and has the advantage of being very distinctive due to the limited numbers on the roads. Number 9 comes under the true enthusiast definition of a sports car. The Westfield range is stripped to the bone and is all about extracting the maximum performance from a tiny engine. It's also unrefined, has a hood that can end a relationship in a hailstorm and doesn't even have a CD player as standard. Which is totally missing the point. On a summer's morning you can take your Westfield down any A road and without needing to bend the speed limit you can comfortably see off the hottest hot hatch. The CD is under the passenger's left arm dear as you listen to the rasp from the side mounted exhaust. This is the Westfield S8 and the only way to describe this car is an absolute beast. Now Chris Smith started Westfield cars back in the late 70s by designing Lotus 7 replicas but the fact that Kay Trill owned the copyright on the design soon put pay to that. So he made some changes and that's how the S8 was born. Now this is as close as you'll ever get to one of those go-karts down at your local track. It weighs little more than a Mini, but it's powered by an incredible engine, a 3.9 litre V8 that's been borrowed from Rover that produces a whopping 270 brake horsepower. Get your foot down, you feel every single one of them pumping through this car. It's an incredible feeling and it's possibly the closest thing you'll get to experience what being struck by a bolt of lightning is like. While it is true that this car is quick, you can't exactly live with it every day and we have to score it down for that. But there is room in the lockable boot for a toothbrush and a change of clothes. What more do you need? How about our number eight, the MGF? It even looks like a hairdresser's car. This is more like it. Once again, this car has a hood you can erect quickly and easily. It has a heater that works, electric windows, and best of all, it's got doors. On the road, the MGF shifts along quite nicely. This 1.8 litre engine remains the same, with the option of the VVC engine, which stands for Variable Valve Control for any of you non-technical types out there. At the time of its launch, the press were amazed by the MGS ride and handling compromise and by the styring from Jerry McGovern, who carried cues from the previous generation's MG models. Yet still managed to look like a hairdresser's car. Our 
Our number seven is the newcomer to the scene, the third generation MR2 from Toyota. An ugly hairdresser's car. Will you cut that out? Sorry. Launched last year, this third incarnation of the MR2 gets back to its roots. The Mark II was bigger, more comfortable and softer than the Mark I. With tricky on-the-limit handling in earlier versions, it did away with small car delicacy, with a 2-litre turbocharged engine making it into a 150 mile per hour cruiser instead. from Toyota are spot on. This really is a hoot to drive. The Mark III has a 1.8 litre engine in a much lighter body. It also gains for the first time in an MR2 a full soft top instead of the previous Targa panels. All of this combines to provide much better throttle response than the outgoing model. It is indeed easier to drive quickly. It's more compact, making for more A-road fun. Unfortunately, and the specialist magazines agree on this, it has a gawky face. You can't say that. I just did. What's more, it's hard to tell whether it looks worse head-on or from behind. A pity, really, for such a well-sorted car. You can't mark it down just for its looks. Well, yes, you can. You don't buy a sports car purely for the drive. Even hairdressers like to pose in the pod car park. Number six, we've cheated a little. It does cost slightly more than our £25,000 limit. That said, the 180 brake horsepower Audi TT convertible is worth saving up a few extra quid for. Indeed. This is a car which looks good, goes well thanks to its permanent four-wheel drive chassis and is so well built you'd think it started life being chiselled from a quarry. When it was shown as a concept car, public reaction to its dazzling looks pushed it into production. The world's press truly drooled over Audi's little sports stand. And then the PR disaster that came when early owners fell off the road with annoying regularity. Actually, there were very few incidents, but you know what the press are like. As far as driving is concerned, well, it is more or less a true sports car. I would say there is some level of compromise there, because as well as the traditional German engineering, which means you could certainly own and run this car every day, it's going to be reliable, it's going to be trustworthy, there is a slight compromise, I guess. This is no Lotus Elise with hard as rock suspension. You could do the miles in this car, and certainly on the motorway, with the six-speed gearbox, it's incredibly relaxed and quiet. With the roof up, it's perhaps the quietest convertible that you'll ever drive. Damage done, we have to mark the otherwise excellent TT down for being over our price limit. Although we can honestly say that every one of our esteemed panel of experts would rush out and buy one, if we paid them anything which is high praise indeed. Number five is another car which promised much and didn't quite deliver, the BMW Z3. In terms of engine layout and styling, this gorgeous Beamer hits the nail right on the head. The aggressive lines manage to look modern while still harking back to the classic sportsters of the 60s. Underneath the skin is the floor pan from the 3 Series Compact, which kept the rear suspension from the 3 Series before last. Yet the biggest problem is the lack of chassis rigidity. The average driver wouldn't spot it, but drive the Z3 gently onto a kerb and the body flexes. At high speeds on the road, this makes it harder for the suspension to do its job properly. Taller drivers may find the cabin a bit of a squeeze, but the rest of the news is good. The interior is cosy and is a very pleasant place to sit, and the hood is effortless to raise. The engine feels very torquey right throughout the range. 0 to 60 takes just nine seconds, and it has a top speed of 130 miles an hour. This five-speed manual version feels just perfect. It's slick, all it takes is a flick of the wrist, and you're working your way through the gears. This makes a fantastic driving experience. The six-speed gearbox is a dream to operate, 
and if you're happy to drive below eight tenths of the handling limits, the engines push you forward with the style you'd expect from BMW. Build quality is faultless for a car in this class, and residuals are better than average for this class of car. As we mentioned earlier, the styling is fantastic and promises a real driver's car, but ultimately, enthusiasts will be slightly disappointed. What do you do when your model range has a staid image for being worthy but dull? You look to inject some pizzazz, and this is exactly what GM did for our number four. They asked Lotus to develop a concept car based on their successful Elise chassis. Just like the Audi TT, public reaction was so favourable that the VX220 made production. On the road, this car gives every enthusiast the kind of buzz more contemporary design simply can't manage. Acceleration is instantaneous, and the same is true of turning to corners and braking. The brakes gain anti-lock systems over the Elise, as well as a slightly more compliant ride. Best of all, you have the kind of exclusivity even Lotus can't offer. Only 1,000 VX220s will be built by Lotus per year. Even then, it looks likely to disappear in a couple of years. refers to the Vauxhall 2.2 litre engine which provides more power than the Elise, although this is countered by the extra weight gained in making the Vauxhall more luxurious. By luxurious we're not talking about Wilton carpets or anything like that. Come to mention it, there are no carpets, but you do see some cloth instead of the more race orientated bare aluminium of its Lotus cousin. For a car said to be more practical than the Lotus, it has to be said that the hood arrangement is at best infuriating. And did anyone mention luggage space? Don't make me laugh. Join us in part two when we look at our top three. Welcome back to the top 10 budget sports cars. We're racing back through the skid pan that is the Granada Staff Canteen into our top three. Number three is a classic which just refuses to go away, the Caterham 7. This car sits at one extreme of our desirability scale. Surely this is the ultimate example of paring down weight to gain maximum performance from an engine. With about as much practicality as a suitcase with a hole in the bottom. Just like the Westfield, you have a hood which takes two people over a minute to erect. And when it's up, well, you need to be a gymnast to climb in. There is not a single frill on this car. Everything is basic and functional. And the controls are incredible. The steering is faster than I can believe. With a tiny little steering wheel, it's accentuated. Before you know what's happening, you really are disappearing up your own what's it. Everything you need is here, even a little tiny indicator. It works, but again, it's pretty functional. back into the world of more practical cars. For the hairdressers out there... Our number two is the Mazda NX-5. Worldwide, this is the best-selling sports car of all time. It seemed to many that the traditional sports car was gone forever when the hot hatch ruled in the mid-80s. MG had gone and enthusiasts were gloomy. Mazda tapped into this mood and set out to engineer the best of the classic roadsters into a new car. If the MX-5 were a potential date, then you would have to say that it has a great personality. 
It isn't exactly stunning to look at, but you know that you're going to have heaps of fun with it. And if it's a long-term commitment that you're looking to make, would you rather have a car that makes you smile when you see it parked on your driveway, or one that makes you grin when you get it out on the open road? I love roadsters. The enthusiast will appreciate the special attention Mazda paid to the ride and handling, with the rear-wheel drive layout giving the right kind of balance. This is truly a car you would love to thread down your favourite A-road. At 10, a cracking little sports car, but only available in left-hand drive and in limited numbers. The Fiat Barchetta. Number 9 is a car that brings enthusiasts what they want at a price few can beat. The Westfield Supersport. Number 8 revives a classic British mark. The MGF also brings a mid-engine layout into the mix. Perhaps a future classic. The Toyota MR2. Its latest incarnation is our number 7 and goes back to its sporting roots. Number six is a real smoothie, the Audi TT. Marked down here for being slightly over our budget, but a cracking car all the same. Number five promises so much from its aggressive styling and BMW engineering, but ultimately the Z3 disappoints slightly when you get to drive it. Number four is the car built by Lotus for Vauxhall. Confused? Well, don't be. Just drive it and judge it by the huge grin you'll have on your face. Number three is the oldest and possibly the purest sporting design in our 10, the Caterham 7. Number two, it's the best-selling sports car of all time, the Mazda MX-5. Surely a future classic. This model forced everyone else to rush their own roadsters into production. Thank you, Mazda. So the cream rises to the top, and you just cannot have a top 10 sports car without a Lotus being in there somewhere. Next time anybody you're talking to who owns one of these things starts bragging about its capabilities, believe them. Believe everything. They might be the biggest pub ball you've ever met, but everything they say is true. The exterior styling had elements of Lotus's first mid-engine production car, the Europa. With subtle modern cues as well, all the elements were there for a success. Customers flocked to buy an Elise, loving the bare aluminium interior which gave the air of a racing car and delighting at the performance from the Rover K-Series engine. It really does corner like nothing else you'll ever drive. It stops. The stopping power is unbelievable. And it really is all about communicative controls. And that sounds new, really, but it is. Everything about the car talks you. The steering is as direct as it could possibly be without being heavy. The brakes are precisely the same. They're non-servo. And the more you apply the pressure, it sounds obvious, the more it'll break for you. But until you've really felt a proper braking system like this, you don't know what it's like. It's an absolutely astounding car to drive. Soon, from being a company on the verge of extinction, Lotus were rejuvenated, and the credit goes to this one model. 
the lightweight and Lotus's chassis expertise make for a ride and handling mix that is truly impressive. This is widely regarded as the benchmark for the Roadster market, which is why it's our very popular number one. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Lotus Elise. Join us on next week's Top 10 Auto Show when we look at the Top 10 Convertibles.